In the course of a very eventful life, Mark Twain, whose real name was Samuel Langhorn Clemens, lived in a lot of different places, from the small farmhouse where he was born in Florida, Missouri, in 1835, to his boyhood home that's now a major tourist attraction in Hannibal, Missouri. Then there's the homes of his later years, like his residence that once stood on Fifth Avenue in New York City, or his final house, Stormfield, which was located in Redding, Connecticut, where he died in 1910. But the house where he lived the longest, 17 years, between 1874 and 1891, was an elaborate, high Victorian Gothic-style building in Hartford, Connecticut. This house was part of a neighborhood in the city called Nook Farm, where many of Hartford's most prominent and interesting residents built grand, high-style houses in the second half of the 19th century. Many of the buildings erected by Mark Twain's neighbors are now lost, but a number of them survive today, most appearing much as they did 150 years ago, while the oldest of them all has been much altered over the years. These were the homes of writers, newspaper editors, lawyers, and activists. Among them were author and abolitionist Harriet Beecher Stowe, who lived just across the lawn from Mark Twain, while down the street lived Stowe's half-sister, the women's suffrage leader Isabella Beecher Hooker, and her husband, the lawyer John Hooker. Mark Twain co-wrote the novel The Gilded Age with neighbor Charles Dudley Warner, who was a writer and editor of the Hartford Current newspaper. Actor William Gillette, famed for playing Sherlock Holmes on the stage, was born in Nook Farm, and later, some years after Twain had left Hartford, Hollywood star Catherine Hepburn grew up in one of the old Nook Farm homes. At that time, in the early 20th century, Nook Farm was sometimes called Literary Lawn because of the famous authors who had once lived there. In this video, I'm going to tell you about these and other neighbors of Mark Twain and about their amazing residences. And I'll also show you what Nook Farm in Hartford, Connecticut is like today. Sam Clemens first visited Hartford in 1868 because the American Publishing Company, located in the city, was publishing his first book, The Innocents Abroad. He fell in love with the city, writing, quote, Of all the beautiful towns it has been my fortune to see, this is the chief. You do not know what beauty is if you have not been here, unquote. After living briefly in Buffalo, New York, Clemens and his wife Olivia Langdon moved to Hartford in 1871, renting the house of John and Isabella Beecher Hooker, which I'll talk more about later in this video. In 1874, he moved into his own house, designed by Edward Tuckerman Potter, which is where he would live until his financial difficulties forced him to move out in 1891. It was while living here that he wrote classic books like Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. It was also here that he raised his three daughters, Susie, Clara, and Jean. The house looks much today as it did when he lived here, the most significant external alteration made by Sam Clemens was the extension of the original pyramidal roofed kitchen wing, which was extended to the north towards Farmington Avenue in 1881. Mark Twain's house was located at the northwestern edge of the neighborhood called Nook Farm. The neighborhood's development had started about two decades before Twain began to build his house. This is a section from the 1869 Atlas of Hartford and Tallinn Counties, 
It shows the area of Nook Farm five years before the Mark Twain house was built. The neighborhood took its name from the fact that the north branch of the Park River, which bordered the area to the west, joined the south branch just to the south before continuing eastwards. That made this section, south of Farmington Avenue, a distinct corner, or nook, nestled between the river to its west and south. For years, this area had been the farm of William Imlay before two brothers-in-law, Francis Gillette and John Hooker, purchased the property in 1853 and began selling off house lots. As this map shows, by 1869, many of these lots, located along Forest, Hawthorne, and Imlay streets, had been sold, while many were still owned by Gillette and Hooker. A few houses existed by this point, while some owners, like Charles Smith and Franklin Chamberlain, had yet to build on their properties. The houses that had been built tended to be set on large lots, often with a number of outbuildings, and were set far back from the street. Nook Farm was a wooded and bucolic environment, with the grounds of one property merging into the next in what has been described as a park-like setting. This was very much in keeping with the landscape designer Alexander Jackson Downing's writings in the mid-19th century. In works like Cottage Residences and Architecture of Country Houses, Downing encouraged the construction of houses built in the Romantic Gothic and Italianate styles set in picturesque landscapes reminiscent of the English countryside. Hartford's urban development had not yet reached Nook Farm, and so its residents could create a landscape Downing would have approved of. I'll talk about the origins of the neighborhood in a bit, but let's start with the northwest corner of Nook Farm, the lot that had been acquired by lawyer Franklin Chamberlain. Located south of Farmington Avenue, between Forest Street on the east and the north branch of the Park River to the west, this is where Mark Twain and Harriet Beecher Stowe would eventually live as neighbors. On the left is a section of the atlas that shows this lot in the year 1880, 11 years after the 1869 atlas. By this time, it was divided among four owners, and there were seven structures. The first houses to be built here were two nearly identical ones close to Forest Street. One of these was the Gothic Revival-style house that we now know of as the Harriet Beecher Stowe House. It was actually erected in 1871 by Chamberlain, who lived here briefly before selling it in 1873 to Harriet and her husband Calvin a retired professor and biblical scholar. By the way, the 1880 atlas misprints Stowe as Stone. Just to the south was another house built at the same time that was a mirror image of the Stowe house, except it had its front facing north instead of east like the Stowe house, so that its side faced towards Forest Street. Labeled Barnum in the 1880 atlas, it is commonly known as the Hall Porter House, after Chamberlain's law partner, Ezra Hall, whose widow later married Dr. William Porter. The house was torn down to become a parking lot when the Harriet Beecher Stowe House was restored to become a museum in the 1960s. Located west of the Porter Hall House was Franklin Chamberlain's Carriage House, also built in 1871. This building survives today. It's now the visitor center for the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center, and Franklin Chamberlain's initials can be found on the side of the building. In 1874, Samuel Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain, built his own carriage house just to the west, and north of that, of course, was his own house which had a Farmington Avenue address. Just east of the Twain House was a greenhouse that stood here into the early 20th century 
Initially, as shown on the 1880 atlas, it was on Chamberlain's property, although the Clemenses were able to use it. It's said that Chamberlain wanted to build a mansion that would rival the Mark Twain house. Chamberlain's house was not completed until 1884, but the 1880 atlas shows that Chamberlain had begun construction very close to the Twain house, in fact, right in front of it. The following year, the Clemenses acquired a strip of land that included the greenhouse and the original planned site of the Chamberlain House. As shown in the section of the 1896 Hartford Atlas on the right, Chamberlain eventually built his house a little further east of the Twain House and closer to Forest Street. That house survives today. It was designed by the architect Francis Kimball in the Queen Anne style. After Chamberlain, the house was the residence of Willie O. Burr, editor of the Hartford Times newspaper. Calvin Stowe passed away in 1886, and Harriet Beecher Stowe died a decade later. Their son Charles sold the house. By the early 1920s, it was in need of repair, and the property was quite overgrown. In 1923, Harry Bond, owner of Hartford's Bond Hotel, acquired the Stowe House and cleared the brush. In restoring the house, he removed the old side porches and kitchen pantry on the south side so he could have a driveway leading to a new garage he had built behind the house, which has since been demolished. Intending to live in the home, he soon changed his mind, and in 1924, he sold the Stowe House to Catherine Seymour Day, a granddaughter of Harriet Beecher Stowe's half-sister, Isabella Beecher Hooker. Catherine Day later purchased the neighboring Chamberlain Burr House and left both buildings, together with the 1871 Chamberlain Carriage House, to become a museum and research library, initially known as the Stowe Day Foundation, but later renamed the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center. The Stowe House was restored to its 19th century appearance, including a reconstructed pantry and side porches. Behind the Day House, a gravel area marks the location of the Stowe Center's underground vault, where the library's archival material is stored. As for the Twain House and the Twain Carriage House, as I mentioned, the Clemens family left the home in 1891. This was because Sam Clemens had fallen into serious financial debt due to the failure of his publishing company and his bad investments, most notably in the failed typesetting machine called the Page Compositor. The family moved to Europe where it was actually cheaper for them to rent than to maintain their lavish lifestyle in Hartford. Eventually, Twain went on a round-the-world lecture tour to get out of debt. With those funds, he and his wife could have returned to the house in Hartford, but there were too many difficult memories. In 1896, while they were still abroad, their oldest daughter, Susie, had returned to the home for a visit, and passed away from spinal meningitis. As shown in this section of the Hartford Atlas for that year, the property is labeled as being owned by Twain's wife, Olivia Clemens. She came from a wealthy family, and it was mostly her money that had paid for the house. At one point, Twain would also transfer his copyrights to her to protect the family income from his creditors. The Clemens property sloped downhill to the west towards the Park River. The river was placed through an underground conduit in the 20th century, and part of the former landscape, where it now runs underground, contains the Mark Twain House and Museum's driveway and parking lot, and the Mark Twain apartments. The Clemenses sold the house in 1903 to the Bissell family.
In the 19-teens and early 20s, the house was home to the Kingswood School for Boys, now part of Kingswood Oxford School. Later, the downstairs became the children's branch of the Hartford Public Library, while the upstairs rooms were rented out as apartments. In the early 1970s, the house was restored to become a museum, and a new museum building was erected just to the south about 20 years ago. Now that I've talked about the Twain, Stowe, and Chamberlain properties, let's go back to the Atlas of 1869 to consider the rest of the neighborhood. As I mentioned, Nook Farm was developed by Gillette and Hooker, who were brothers-in-law and law partners. Francis Gillette, originally from what's now Bloomfield, Connecticut, was a politician who served in the U.S. Senate in the 1850s. He was married to Elizabeth, sister of John Hooker, who was also a lawyer and a descendant of Hartford founder Thomas Hooker. Francis and Elizabeth initially occupied the old farmhouse on the west side of Forest Street that had existed from the days of the Imlay Farm. It was here that their son William Gillette was born in 1853. As I mentioned, he would become a famous actor and playwright, most noted for his performances as Sherlock Holmes. He would later build Gillette's castle, the famous landmark along the Connecticut River. Within a few years, the Gillettes moved from the farmhouse to a brand new home on the next lot northwards. But this was not the first of the new Nook Farm homes to be built. In 1853, John Hooker erected a home on the east side of Forest Street, just north of the intersection with Hawthorne Street. Also on this property were two smaller homes, one built for his widowed mother, the other rented by Reverend Nathaniel Judson Burton. Also nearby was the home of another law partner, Joseph Hawley, who served as governor of Connecticut in the later 1860s. As I mentioned, John Hooker was married to Harriet Beecher Stowe's half-sister, Isabella. In 1861, the couple hired local architect Octavius Jordan to expand their original home into a stylish Gothic Revival villa. This picturesque residence had a two-story porch on its east side. This photograph shows John and Isabella in their later years sitting on their lawn with the porch in the background. In 1899, John Hooker published his memoirs called Some Reminiscences of a Long Life. In it, he described the social life of Nook Farm. Quote, the early comers were generally family or personal friends, and we lived like a little society by ourselves, each of us making free of the other's houses, and each keeping open house, and all of us frequently gathering for a social evening, or to welcome some friendly visitor, often some person distinguished in political, literary, or philanthropic life, who had come to some of our houses." Unquote. In the 1870s, Isabella Beecher Hooker became a leader in the women's suffrage movement, working with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. But her devotion to the radical Victoria Woodhull strained her relationship with the extended Beecher family. That family drama is probably a subject for another video. Isabella's father, Reverend Lyman Beecher, was a prominent congregational minister. He fathered 11 children, all seven of his sons, five of whom are shown standing in this family photograph, became ministers as well, the famous Beecher preachers the most well-known of whom was Henry Ward Beecher, who was a celebrity pastor and abolitionist, who also got involved in an adultery scandal in the 1870s. That's another subject for a different video sometime. The Beecher sisters included Isabella, 
the youngest, and Catherine, the eldest. The middle sisters, Mary Beecher Perkins and Harriet Beecher Stowe, would both join Isabella by moving to Nook Farm in Hartford. Mary and her husband, the prominent lawyer, Thomas Clapp Perkins, lived from 1855 to 1866 in another Gothic Revival-style house on the south side of Hawthorne Street, just across from the Hooker House. This was next the home, from 1866 to 1884, of the author Charles Dudley Warner, editor of the Hartford Evening Press and then of the Hartford Current after the two papers merged in 1867. Witty sketches about his gardening experiences on this property that appeared in The Current were collected in the 1870 book My Summer in a Garden. In that book he also mentions a visit to Nook Farm by Ulysses S. Grant, whose memoirs were later published by Mark Twain. In 1871, Mark Twain started renting the Hooker House across the street from the Warner House. One evening, when the two men had been criticizing some novels their wives had been discussing, the women challenged them to write a better novel. The result was the 1873 novel The Gilded Age, co-written by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner. Much later, from 1908 to 1917, the house was home to the family of Dr. Thomas Hepburn and his wife, Catherine Houghton Hepburn, which meant it was also the childhood home of their daughter, actor Catherine Hepburn. This is a photograph of the house's backyard, circa 1920. Sadly, the Perkins Warner Hepburn house was later torn down, but a very similar house, albeit much larger, also designed by Octavius Jordan, does survive nearby on the west side of Woodland Street, not far northwest of Nook Farm. Called the Perkins Clark House, it was built in 1861 for Mary and Thomas Perkins' son Charles, who was also a lawyer. It now serves as an architect's office. Another similar but even grander Gothic Revival house, called Oakholm, was also designed by Octavius Jordan. It was erected in 1864 for Harriet Beecher Stowe and her husband Calvin. This was her original Nook Farm residence. Harriet's fame as the author of the anti-slavery novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, which she wrote in the early 1850s when living in Brunswick, Maine, launched a writing career in which she wrote more than 30 books, including novels, travel narratives, and domestic advice. Unfortunately, the financial strain of maintaining Oakholm led her to sell it after just a few years. She would then move into the building that today is known as the Harriet Beecher Stowe House. The financial difficulties of owning the grand residences of Nook Farm affected many of its homeowners, including Stowe, Twain, and the Hookers, which explains why the latter couple rented their house to Mark Twain for two years before he moved into his own home. Harriet's Oak Home was located at the southeastern edge of Nook Farm, away from the other houses and close to the Park River. This vicinity was soon taken over by factories. Oak Holm eventually became a storehouse for the Hartford Cycle Works, and it was torn down in 1905. I have another video just about Oak Holm where I discuss where it was located. I'll link to it at the end of this video, so watch to the end and you can check that out. Another notable early Nook Farm house that's indicated in the 1869 atlas was the 1858 house of Newton Case of the prominent Hartford Printing Company of Case, Lockwood, and Brainerd. After his death in 1890, his daughter Ellen Case occupied the house until she passed away in 1907. Unlike the Hooker and Perkins family's preference for the Gothic revival, 
The case house was an Italianate villa, which was the other architectural style favored by A.J. Downing for country cottage residences. After Ellen Case's death, the property was sold and subdivided, and Marshall Street was extended through it south of Farmington Avenue. During the 1870s, there was a boom in construction at Nook Farm. On the east side of Forest Street, south of the Case House and north of the Hooker House, Charles Boardman Smith of the Smith Worthington Saddlery Company erected a grand brick residence. It was designed by Richard M. Upjohn, who was also the architect of Connecticut State Capitol Building. Like the Capitol Building and the Mark Twain House, the Smith House was built in the high Victorian Gothic style, one of its distinctive features being bands of contrasting color or texture in the brickwork, here featured above and below the rows of windows. Another significant high Victorian Gothic style house was completed two years later across the street from the Smith House and just north of the Gillette House. It was erected for Charles Dudley Warner's brother, George H. Warner. Catherine Hepburn would make movies for Hollywood's Warner Brothers, but Hartford also had its own Warner Brothers who were Nook Farm neighbors. George had married Francis Gillette's daughter Elizabeth, which made him the brother-in-law of William Gillette. This section from the Hartford Atlas of 1880 shows the Smith House, which I just talked about, on the east side of Forest Street. The previous year, 1879, Francis Gillette had passed away, so his son-in-law, George H. Warner, is listed as the owner of the former Gillette property, including the old Gillette House. Just to the north, in 1873, George Warner erected a new house designed by the architect Edward Tuckerman Potter, who would also design Mark Twain's house. About a decade later, in 1884, George's brother Charles Dudley moved into the house with his wife, Susan Lee Warner, while George resided in the old Gillette homestead. Unlike the Mark Twain house, the Warner house does not survive today. There are many images of the house, which was an architectural cousin to the Twain house, both displaying contrasting bands of color and texture in their brickwork. Also, like the Twain house, the Warner house had a pyramidal-roofed servant's wing at the rear. The Warner Brothers' houses occupied a wooded and picturesque property, now long gone and occupied by Hartford Public High School and the Mark Twain Museum building. Located between the two houses was a round pond with a fountain. Grace King, a writer from New Orleans who stayed with the Warners in 1887, was impressed by the park-like setting, noting that there were no other houses visible through the trees. In her memoirs, she describes the tall stream of the Warner Fountain, quote, breaking into foam at the top, and falling so softly that it did not ruffle the mirror-like surface beneath." Unquote. This is a section of the 1896 Hartford Atlas. By this time, the boundary between the two brothers' properties was clearly demarcated. The fountain was still there, indicated on the map. Within twelve years, though, it would be gone. However, the grove of trees that surrounded it remained. For years, they still sheltered an open space that formed a natural amphitheater, capable of seating about a thousand people. And so it was here, on May 28, 1908, that Ben Greet, the British Shakespearean actor and impresario, and his Ben Greet players gave outdoor performances of As You Like It and A Midsummer Night's Dream followed by a bonus performance of Twelfth Night the following evening. It was a picturesque setting. The area used as a stage was on the edge of the bank overlooking the Park River. This section of the 1896 atlas also shows that many houses had been erected along the west side of Forest Street, in front of the two Warner houses 
and their sylvan landscape. Still in existence in 1896 was the old farmhouse that predated the development by Hooker and Gillette. This was the same house where William Gillette had been born. The old building had been split in two and moved. One half became an outbuilding behind the house closest to the corner of Forest and Hawthorne Streets, while the other half was moved just to the south to its own lot right at the northwest corner of Forest and Hawthorne. This oldest relic of Nook Farm would be taken down in 1909. In the early 1960s, the two Warner houses and all of the ones in front of them would be demolished to make way for the new high school. This aerial photograph shows the area before the coming of the Interstate Highway and the construction of Hartford Public High School. On the east side of Forest Street, just north of Hawthorne Street, is the Hooker House, which is now surrounded by apartment blocks and parking lots. Turning to the current location of the high school, it shows the Charles Dudley Warner House, which, as I mentioned, was originally built for his brother George. Just in front of the Warner House was the 1890s shingle-style house of the poet and professor of literature Richard Eugene Burton, the son of Reverend Judson Burton. South of the Burton House on Forest Street was another shingle-style residence, the Edward Perkins House, which stood just in front of the grove where the Warner Fountain had been and where the Ben Greet players had performed Shakespeare in 1908. Just south of that, and set back from Forest Street, was the Gillette House, which, as I mentioned, was later owned by George H. Warner. His brother Charles Dudley Warner had died in 1900, and George passed away in 1919. A few years later, the house was acquired by the lawyer Lucius F. Robinson to become a home for his son. Robinson himself resided in a substantial house on the adjoining lot just to the southeast, closer to Forest Street. One of the remaining houses on Forest Street, north of Hawthorne Street, was the Colonial Revival-style home of the lawyer John R. Buck, a Republican who had served two terms in the U.S. House of Representatives in the 1880s. Of course, as I mentioned, all of these buildings were removed in the early 1960s to make way for the high school. As for the houses on the east side of the street, several survive today, including the 1871 Smith House, which is just to the right beyond the frame of this picture. Also surviving are two houses just south of it, built in the early 20th century, and also an 1895 Queen Anne-style house. Finally, there's the old house built by John and Isabella Beecher Hooker, which, as I mentioned, is now surrounded by apartment buildings. The lawn, where John and Isabella once sat, is now a parking lot. The Hooker house itself was greatly altered over the years. The house was raised up when an extra story was added in 1906, and in 1924, a port cochere was built onto the front. The house was later subdivided into apartments. A change in the bricks on the west end of the house is evidence of the 1906 enlargement. If you walk down Forest Street, seeking the Hooker House, which, remember, was also once the residence of Mark Twain, you'll find it hidden behind the later apartment buildings. This section from the 1877 Bird's Eye View of Hartford shows the Nook Farm houses that existed at that time during the community's heyday. There's Harriet Beecher Stowe's Oak Home at the southern edge of the neighborhood, which at this time, 1877, was being encroached upon by factories. Zooming into the Forest Street area, on the south side of Hawthorne Street, there's the lost Perkins House, home to Harriet Beecher Stowe's sister Mary, and later home to Charles Dudley Warner, and later still the young Catherine Hepburn. On the west side of Forest Street, there's the old Imlay Farmhouse, 
although it had been moved by this point. A little further north is the Gillette House, later home to George Warner, and then there's the house George built that was later lived in by his brother, Charles Dudley Warner. Further north are the Hall Porter and Harriet Beecher Stowe houses. The Chamberlain Day House had not been built yet, but the Chamberlain and Twain carriage houses were there, the adjacent greenhouse, and, of course, the Mark Twain house. Moving to the east side of Forest Street, there's the lost Case House, the surviving Smith House, the lost house once occupied by Reverend Burton, and lastly, the original Nook Farm mansion built by John and Isabella Beecher Hooker, and now an apartment building. Before you click away, remember to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching. And don't forget to watch my video about Oakholm.